Welcome to the Painting Experience Podcast for June 2015. On the podcast, founder Stuart Cubley explores the potential of the emerging field of process arts and shares inspiration from his ongoing workshops and retreats. This time, Stuart talks about why we're encouraged not to cover things up in our process paintings, about finding the satisfaction that comes from accepting what shows up in a painting and following it through to the end. In the last podcast, I spoke about not commenting on each other's paintings in the painting workshops. And today I'd like to talk about not covering, not changing, not turning a painting. And at first blush, this may feel like, gosh, there's a lot of knots here. What are all these knots? Not do this, not do that. And what does that have to do with creative freedom and and painting for process? But actually, it's the other way around. These knots are actually big yeses. And they're yeses to the process of painting, the serendipity of painting, the unexpected nature of painting. So let me explain a little bit. What is covering, actually? This often occurs at a certain point in the painting. You're painting along and some area of the painting is disturbing you a little bit and you feel like, you know, I don't want that. There's something not right about that. So our first impulse, of course, is to cover it up, change it, get rid of it, obliterate it, redo it, do something that's going to make it better. And this is very natural, of course, But if we look a little deeper, we realize that there's another way to respond here. It's very natural to want to make the painting look better. That's our first response. And of course, this comes out of the the more habitual way of approaching painting and art, which is more of a fine arts perspective. It's more of a product-oriented perspective. And of course, we want a nice painting. We want it to look good. We want it to please us. We want it to somehow fulfill our intention. And so it feels very natural when it's not going in that direction to cover something up and redo it. But from the perspective of of process arts, which is a very different intention, which is using the tools of painting, not for product, but for self-exploration, for self-reflection, and for insight, then we need a different approach because that which appears and perhaps does not please us and perhaps does feel out of place and disturbs us to some degree has shown up. After all, we painted it. Where did it come from? It's not something extraneous that's imposed itself in our world. I mean, we did it. We painted it. So the real question is, do we respect that? Do we meet that? Do we get intrigued by the fact that that's appeared and learn to read that disturbance in a different type of way, in a way in which we don't cover to get rid of it, and in a way in which we don't alter it or obliterate it, but that we use it and that we look under the surface a little bit and realize that that disturbing feeling that's coming up about that area of the painting is actually a call. And there's a way of working with it that will enter that rather than cover that or obliterate that. Now, this is really not so easy to bring into practice because we want a nice painting. I mean, that's kind of the ego stance, right? And it goes quite deep because a nice painting means a nice painter. We identify with the product that we're creating. And to have something that we don't like challenges the very sense of ourselves on some level. And so this is not small change we're dealing with. But there is an opportunity to relate to this in a different way. And when someone comes to that point where their impulse would be to cover something up, or they'll often start, doing it, and I'll observe them doing it, 
there will be an appropriate time in which I'll approach them about that. And I must say, I often don't do this in the beginning of a workshop because I don't want to alienate that person. I mean, I have to develop a relationship. There has to be some trust. There has to be some water under the bridge. The person has to feel like they're not being judged and they're not being coerced or manipulated, that there's a deep trust in their own internal investigation. And if that's established, then the person is more open to hear what I might have to say about covering and not take it as though there's something wrong, but for that person to feel like we're on the same side. And so I might approach that person at that point and question the feelings that are going on underneath the desire to cover and the action of covering. And usually, as I say, there is some sort of judgment going on and there's some sort of disturbance. And we haven't really been educated how to relate to that. So our first impulse is get rid of. Don't like, cover it up, change the color, redo the, the image, whatever form it takes. Or sometimes just take that painting off the wall. But if we don't cover, if and in fact we have a stance in which we accept whatever arises, and we deem as sacred what shows up. And the very fact that we painted it and it came out of the tip of our brush takes more weight than any kind of aesthetic judgment that we would have about it. And so we begin to develop a different kind of relationship in which we are no longer so much in control. Because the desire to cover and to change and to maybe reorient the painting and turn the painting to a different orientation are all ways in which we're trying to control the outcome. We're trying to fulfill a certain intention that may be more or less clear to us, but we are trying to fulfill some internal idea. And therefore, we're more in control of the situation. We're trying to make it fit our idea. Whereas if we don't do that, we metaphorically paint ourselves into a corner because it means then that whatever shows up, we have to stick with. And whatever shows up is not something we can get rid of, but we have to work with. And it doesn't mean we have to stop painting. Sometimes people think, well, if I have to not cover anything I painted, then I can't paint once I get paint on the paper. But no, that's not the case. There's a way of adding to what's there, which is very different than changing. For example, sometimes people say, you know, this whole area here that I painted in orange, it shouldn't be orange. I was actually kind of asleep when I painted the orange. I was just not present, and therefore I'm going to change it to blue. We have all sorts of great justifications for why we want to have it our way, and sometimes people will say that to me. And so they'll change the whole area to blue. And of course, that's covering. That, that orange that was there is now gone. There is a different way to relate to that, that if that orange was disturbing you and therefore calling you, you could have blue dots in the orange. You could have blue flames coming out of the orange. You could have a, a blue baby in the middle of the orange. Who knows what? There could be something that would be a way of respecting the orange and yet moving forward in the painting not getting rid of, adding versus covering. And this creates a very different relationship to the creative process because we then begin to respect the serendipity. We then begin to be intrigued by that which arises spontaneously, that which comes unbidden. That's not a function of the product-oriented ego. That's not our control making happen. We begin to develop a different relationship to that part of the psyche, which underlies our lives in a very, very profound way. And of course, is there outside of the painting process as well. And the painting process becomes a way of tapping into that, of acknowledging that, of moving with that, and allowing that to penetrate us more deeply because it's without conflict. The need to change a painting to make it fit our idea 
and to to meet our preference is conflict laden. It, it turns us in knots, and once we cover once, it's not good enough. Then we have to cover it again, or we have to redo the image six times, and we cover that nose eighteen million times, and it's still not good enough. And finally, say to hell with it. It just leads down a road of increased conflict. And so there's something challenging but incredibly natural and conflict-free once we begin to be intrigued by the serendipity and to respect the serendipity and to go with it. And then the painting becomes a truly unknown journey in which we are no longer trying to make it to fit our specifications, but we're open to the flow that is coming out of us. And there's an intelligence in this flow that we then have the ability to start perceiving. Once we stop controlling, we can then begin to sense, wow, there's more going on here than I realized. And these so-called spontaneous images are not random at all. They're not rational. They don't fit any kind of rationality. And, and very often, any kind of story that I try to tell about them to connect the dots in the painting seems only half satisfying because it's rather made up. But there's an intelligence in it which I can sense through the experience of it. I can sense through the unfolding of it. And I can sense by the fact that it brings me insight into my life in ways that could never have happened if I had just gone with the story of the painting or the aesthetic of the painting. These doors will open up for us once we are willing to give up control and willing to have a profound respect for that which shows up. And so this is why these so-called rules, not covering and not changing and, and not reorienting your painting, are really big yeses. There are ways of saying yes to that part of ourselves that we're trying to develop the respect for. And by reorienting, which I haven't spoken of so much, I mean sometimes there's an urge to turn the painting in a different orientation. Here you started something and it's gone along to a certain degree, and then I, I'll see somebody take the painting off the wall and turn it 90 degrees or 180 degrees. And usually when that happens, it's interesting to explore what's going on there. Usually the person has reached a stopping point of some sort. They're a little bored, perhaps. They don't see where to go next. They don't have an inspiration for moving on. And there's the thought that, well, if I change the orientation, I'll see it in a different perspective. And then I'll be able to go forward. And again, this is partially true. If you do change the orientation of the painting, of course, you will have a different perspective. It's kind of fun to see it differently. But something is lost in that. There's something about standing in the integrity of the way things show up, including the orientation. There's something about being willing to stand in the not knowing of what to do next and let that come from a deeper place in oneself other than a trick of turning the painting and doing something externally, having it come from a place internally. And so... These are ways in which you can learn to fulfill the purpose and I would say the promise of process painting, which is deep respect, honoring the way things arise, following things to the end as they arise, continuing to work with them and listen to them, and not imposing on the painting that it has to meet some criterion that you've decided upon. In doing this, you really shift internally to a different part of yourself. Sometimes I say it's getting out of your own way. It's allowing a deeper stream to be the one that's guiding the process. And this is incredibly satisfying. We get a certain satisfaction, of course, from getting a painting that we like. We also get a certain satisfaction from covering up stuff that we don't like and getting rid of it. And these are very short-term satisfactions. They're also very shaky satisfactions because you may paint a painting that you like after having really worked hard on it to get it like you want it and then somebody can come along and, and make a comment on it and you can feel devastated and your whole perception of the painting changes. You're not sure you like it anymore. Those satisfactions are quite shaky 
Whereas when you learn the deeper satisfaction of accepting what shows up and going with it, you're standing on a very solid ground. You're not so vulnerable to what other people think about it. You've already been willing to go beyond what you think about it. And so what other people think about it is really not so important after all. There's a deeper ground in which you touch and a deeper ground in which you stand. This is really the purpose of process painting. You can learn more about the painting experience and find a list of upcoming process painting workshops by visiting our website at www.processarts.com. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please share it with a friend. The theme music for this podcast comes from Stefan Jacob. We thank you for listening and hope you'll join us again soon.